For years, the LS3 V8 engine has been the go-to power lump for power and torque. But there's a new kid in town, the Tesla large drive unit. So in today's episode, we're going to do a deep dive into comparing this and that. But at the same time, because you're quite familiar with what's inside this, we're going to open up one of these and see what makes it tick. Let's get into it. Now let's start with the LS3 V8. This has pretty much been the go-to power engine, if you like, to upgrade cars like this Land Rover Defender behind me, which is actually where this drivetrain came out of. This Actually, these two Land Rovers were built and prepared by Twisted, one of the top Land Rover Defender specialists in the UK. And these engines, uh, I think they actually came out of Corvettes, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, that'd have been Corvettes, definitely. Definitely a big thing in America is the LS3 uh, V8 upgrade um, and we've got the engine gearbox and transfer box here we've weighed this as well uh, excluding the crate it comes to 400 kilograms power wise it's around about 430 horsepower uh, obviously you can do tweaks and get more power out of these but 430 horsepower is about what they give out but you know these have been the go-to for quite some time and you know technology has moved on because efficiency wise this is not a very good way of turning energy into motion it only uses around about 20 percent and i'm being you know uh, i'm being what am i being generous generous i'm being generous there with 20 percent but it, yeah it turns 20 percent of the energy it's given into motion the rest of it is turned into heat and noise so you could say this is a very efficient machine at turning energy into noise but if we want an efficient machine that turns energy into motion we have to go and have a look at what's over there now what we have here is the 21st century equivalent of the LS3 motor. Still loads of power, still American, but this is the Tesla large drive unit. And this produces a little bit more than the LS3 motor. This produces around about 450 horsepower. Don't forget that produces around about 430. However, if we went for the performance version, because this is the standard LDU, large drive unit. Um, if we went for the performance version, which essentially looks exactly the same, just the internals here are slightly different, that can produce up to 600 horsepower. So, this is the new LS3, if you ask me. And what we have here is the exact equivalent of what's behind me, because we have the motor, or the engine, let's say. We have the gearbox and transfer box. And we also have all the bits and pieces, the electronics, if you like, to make it work. So this is a very fair equivalent of what's behind me there. However, that weighed 400 kilos. This weighs 140 kilos. So it's a lot lighter. It produces actually a lot more torque as well, but it's very efficient. So if I give this energy, 90% of it, 90 is turned into motion. So it's a very efficient way of producing lots of power to make the car go forward. And this beauty here is actually what's gonna go in this Defender behind me. So these two Defenders, we're taking out the LS3 V8s and we're putting in this. Now, I haven't really included everything when I was looking at the LS3 motor because in this crate we have all the other bits and pieces that make it work. So it's the exhaust, there's a manifold down there, the wiring loom and other bits and pieces. In fact, that crate is full of stuff that makes that LS3 motor work. So I should have probably plonked that on top when I was weighing it. So what are we doing? We're taking these two beautiful Land Rover Defenders that used to have those engines in and we're putting the Tesla motor in, which has more torque, more power, more efficient, less pollution, etc. But how does it all work? Now, all you car guys out there, you're very familiar with what makes this work. You know, there's a crank in there, con rods, pistons going up and down, fuel and air comes in, explosions happen. You know how these things work. But how does this work? So I think it's time that we start to di dissect the Tesla Lars drive unit and see what makes this tick. 
A Tesla drive unit like this can be split into three main parts, the motor, the gearbox and the electronics. But to see what's really going on inside, we need to split it apart. And in true Blue Peter fashion... That'll confuse the American audience. That will confuse the American audience. Look it up, Americans. But in true Blue Peter fashion, here's one I prepared earlier. So here is a Tesla drive unit split apart. And we'll start with the business end, the motor. Now from here, this way is the muscle of the Tesla drive unit, the motor. And it's made up of two main parts, the stator, which is stationary, that's this bit around here, and the rotor, which rotates, which is this bit here. And then you've got an end casing here. You've got two bearings, just one there, one there, and that whole lot just sits in there. Now just take a minute to consider how simple that is. This, in the performance drive unit, produces 600 horsepower. That and that produces 600 horsepower, two bearings. How simple is that? Well, that's so, I mean, think how many moving parts to get 600 horsepower in a yeah. petrol engine, thousands. Now, we've both rebuilt and you know, built many engines. And I know how many parts there are in an engine and this is two. Stator, rotor, right. simple as that. And the only thing to fail really is the bearings, isn't it? Yeah. And the bearings are actually worth mentioning. They're ceramic hybrid bearings. So they're not your typical, you know, all metal bearings. The ball bearings are ceramic. Do you know why? Uh, no. A couple of reasons. High RPM. So this can rev up to 18,000 RPM. But ceramic bearings are also thermally um, insulative and uh, electrically insulative. Mm. So, you know, that's why these ceramic bearings in the Tesla drive unit, but they only use them on the rotor for obvious reasons, because you know, you've got all your electromagnetism happening there, which leads me on to the gearbox. Now the rotation of that motor means nothing if you can't convert it to rotation on the wheels, and that's where the gearbox comes in. So this is the middle part of your Tesla drive unit, and we've literally split it in part, uh, you know, split it in half to reveal the gear set inside and again it's really simple it's just three gears inside here so you've got your main diff here actually this is a quaif lsd not an open tesla diff but you get the picture that kind of sits there and transfers the uh, rotation to the wheels or in the land rovers to the props and then you've got your secondary gear set and primary gear set here, which uh, sits on the motor itself, and another here. So that's pretty much it. Simple, isn't it? Again, how many parts there? Three? Three gear sets, and you've got uh, bearings as well on the gear sets. So a couple of bearings, three gears, and that's it. And with the sort of the torque, instant torque on an electric motor, you don't need multiple gears like you do in a... No. In, in, so in, in this a petrol is, engine. There's just a it, single gear, isn't it? Correct, yeah. So there's no first, second, you know, third, reverse gear, etc. All you want to do for reverse is just spin the motor the opposite way. Um, this is a 9.73 to 1 gear reduction unit, which is what's standard in a Tesla Model, uh, Model 3, Tesla large drive unit. We put in a 4 to 1 gear set in, so it's our own um, gear set that we put in when we're putting it into the Land Rovers, because obviously we have to uh, take into account there's another gear reduction happening in the axles. But that's pretty much it, simple. So you've got your motor that produces the rotation, the gear set that then converts that rotation to a meaningful rotation speed, then that goes out to the prop shafts or the axles. But all that isn't going to do anything without the electronics. So let's have a chat about that. Now we've talked about the brawn over there with the motor, but this is the brains. Without this, nothing's going to be happening. So this is the inverter. Now a lot of people think when they look at a Tesla large drive unit for the first time, and I did as well when I didn't know much about them, I thought there was two motors. I thought there was one motor there, then something in the middle, then another motor on the other side. But no, this is just the cover for the inverter. So this takes the DC power. In fact, if I move this out of the way, I'll turn it around a little bit so you can see. So here is the DC power coming in from the battery, but it's got to convert that to AC power for the motor. So DC power coming in here, and you've got three 
inverters, one there, one there, and one behind me here, so it's kind of a, um, a triangle, if you like, and then out comes the three phases. So there's one inverter for each of the phases that then goes through the gearbox to the bus bars over there at the motor. So this is your inverter, and this is the bit that actually is changing between the standard and the performance drive unit. So if you want a 600 horsepower Tesla large drive unit, this looks exactly the same, but it can give more amps. The, the main way to tell the difference is the board on a standard is green, and on the performance versions, it's red. And you can see all the IGBTs in there as well. So this is your Tesla large drive unit inverter. Now, cooling. So the LS3 motor over there, obviously that needs a lot of help cooling because it's a, a very effective way of turning energy into noise and heat, lots of heat. So you can have a big radiator, you gotta have lots of coolant going through it. But you might think with the Tesla drive unit being 90% efficient, does it really need coolant going through it? Yes, it does. So how and where does the coolant flow through a Tesla drive unit? Do you know, Tim? Well, I know there's some pipes on either end that it goes in one end and out the other. Yep. I don't know what it does inside, though. Do you want to see where it goes? Yeah. Go on in. Let's have a look over here. Okay, so it comes in here. So essentially that sits on there like that. So your coolant comes in here. Then it splits immediately into two paths. So the main path goes through here, which then move that out of the way, that goes in here, and then that goes around the stator. So this is a water jacket around the stator here, so it goes around there, then it comes through, so you're going to have to come over here now. Oh, there's going to be some groaning now. Got um, old man noises. Yeah. So, yeah, come around here so you can see where it comes oh, through. More groaning. So, and it comes out here, after it cools down the uh, stator. So it comes out here, it goes through the other side on the casing here. Yeah. You can see that there. And it comes through, and then you've got some coolant ways cast into here. Then that goes through the inverter, and then back, so you can see here. Uh, if I turn that round, it might make your life a little bit easier. So you can see there the three different um, uh, components of the inverter, so the three phases of the inverter. So it goes in and out there, comes, goes through there again, and then comes out here. But you're probably wondering, what about the other path? So let's go back to the start again and cover the other path that the coolant takes. This is doing my knees no good at all, you know. <laughs> so if we put that back in there. So the other path that the coolant takes, instead of going this way through the stator, it also goes up here. Now this is the Achilles heel of the large Tesla drive units because Tesla are overly clever here. They thought by sending some coolant this way and then through here, so this essentially goes through the rotor because it rotates, goes through the inside of that and then back out and then you'll see there's a seal in there so this, this should sit over there and stop any coolant coming out of its coolant path and into where you don't really want it which is in the motor. And then it comes out of there, goes up the top here, so if we put that back on there and in there, there's then a pipe that then joins this over to here, so you see that point there? Yeah. Goes through there and then again through the casting here, through that little tiny hole there, so you see that little tiny hole here, and it comes around to this side and it takes a path around there and that helps cool the gearbox and the oil through there and then it comes out there and joins the rest of the coolant that's the majority if you like that's cooling the the stator and the inverter there and then goes out now i mentioned the achilles heel because the weak point is if we go back over here that seal so this seal can fail essentially so it can let coolant from this side in here and then you get coolant going in this area here which is why this uh, motor is scrap effectively you can see the amount of rust in there in fact if I turn it around there you can see how high the coolant level got there see that tide mark there yeah, yeah. that was because 
of a coolant leak through that seal there and essentially it just um, fill the motor full of coolant and eventually you'll get um, some isolation issues in the motor. So what is the fix? Well I'll show you. Let's talk about the coolant delete, which is what it's called in the Tesla world. So the aim of the game here is to stop the coolant from going up this way and into the motor. And you know that's where the Achilles heel is, that seal in there. So now Tesla themselves, what they have is a different casting now that they put on the motors, which doesn't allow the coolant to go up this way, if you like. So independent tests, I'm sure Tesla have done their own tests, but independent tests have shown that if you do a coolant delete, the temperature of the motor doesn't really change. So the effectiveness of putting coolant up through the rotor is negligible. So what most people do in the aftermarket world is either they put on a, a nice billet replacement for one of these, it stops that coolant going up that way, very nice bit of kit, quite expensive though, or they'll put a cup very cheap and easy way of doing it, which you put a cup inside there that kind of protects um, the coolant from going this way. And what we do, because we've got the capability of doing it, is very simple. You just cut and shut this here, so that essentially instead of looking like that, it looks like that. So you can see it on this one here. We just cut and cut there. You have to take that off to do it. You can't do it in situ because obviously you'll have swarf and the stuff going everywhere. So you take that off, plug weld that, plug weld that, but also plug weld the, the uh, pipe that goes over to the gearbox side of things as well and just stops any coolant going this way. So all the coolant goes around the rotor, through the inverter and out. And we also have not, uh, noticed no change in the thermal efficiency of the motor. The motor's not getting hot, the gearbox isn't getting hot, the oil isn't getting any hotter. We've had probes on, done some thermal tests. There's no difference between a motor that has a coolant delete on or doesn't have a coolant delete on. So I recommend anybody out there messing around with large test drive units, do a coolant delete on it. You will save that motor in the long run. <laughs> Tell you what, all I need now is some pedals and a steering wheel. It's wacky races, isn't it? Wacky races, yeah. I reckon uh, I should build Dad a new motorbike. What do you reckon? Just get well, a that, frame. That with two wheels? Yeah. Be Handle scary. It there. Nah. I think it's fair to say Dad has moved on with his electric zero motorbike and so have I. So, yeah, technology has moved on. You've seen what goes into this now, the amount of, or amount of, the lack of moving parts, if you like, compared to this over here. Uh, I, I would say this has probably got thousands of moving parts in it, uh, whereas this, what was it, you know, a handful, let's say. So there must be a huge difference in maintenance as well between the two. Yes, that's a good point, actually. On this, the only maintenance side of things you've got is the gear oil, so you need to treat the gear oil the same as you'd treat the gear, ball, gear oil in here. So it'd say, what, anything from, uh, well, probably 100,000 miles, um, sort of, you need to change the gear oil. Um, but then this, as in the engine side of things, is where you need to spend a lot of maintenance. I mean, you've got oil changes, you've got filters, you've got uh, tune-ups, you've got belts to change, spark plugs, all sorts of things you've got to change uh, or keep an, uh, an eye on. There's a lot of babysitting of an engine. I mean, oil changes alone in an LS3 is probably anything from every 5,000 to every 10,000, best case scenario. So you're probably talking anything from 10 to 20 oil changes compared to the one on this uh, over 100,000 miles. So yeah, a load more maintenance on that. So advantage wise, I mean, you've got more power, more efficient, um, less maintenance, cheaper to run, um, less pollution, less moving parts. So you can see now why I have moved towards electric vehicles and away from this. I'm totally drivetrain agnostic. I'm not against engines, petrol, diesel, etc. I've just moved to this because it's more power, more reliably. But I've made my choice. This is where I see the future. Do you agree? Comments below. And on that note, hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you on the next one.